Please welcome the chair of the Greater Oklahoma City Chamber, Rhonda Hooper. This is, the, this is always the hardest part to get everybody to quit talking and sit down. <laughs> but that just means that we're a great chamber and you're great people to be here. But good morning, welcome to the annual Stay of the Schools event that is hosted by the Greater Oklahoma City Chamber. Today marks the 14th year of the State of the Schools luncheon. And the Chamber wanted to hold this on an annual basis, basically to share opportunities to reflect and discuss on timely issues that are surrounding our education and our community. But first, before we start our program, I'd like to recognize all the elected officials in the room. There are over 30 elected officials from state and local government with us today. Thank you for your commitment to, for first of all, being here. Thank you for your commitment to our children and their education. Would you be so kind to please stand and let us recognize and say thank you. All elected officials. That felt kind of like the wave. <laughs> but no, thank you so much for your leadership in moving our education forward. Um, I'd also like to thank and recognize our signature sponsor for today, and that's Bank of Oklahoma. Uh, please welcome to the stage John Higginbotham, CEO of Bank of Oklahoma, Oklahoma City. And you're already behind me. I can hear your footsteps. <laughs> cool. Thank you, Rhonda. Bank of Oklahoma recognizes the critical funding needs of our public schools and continues to make investments in them through the bank's employees and financial resources. BOK has targeted specific projects through the Partners in Action program administered by the Foundation of Oklahoma City Public Schools. The program allows principals to post specific school needs and community partners like Bank of Oklahoma to fund those needs. Bank of Oklahoma supported a few of these, uh, a sustainable ecosystem project for Northeast Mid-High, math tools and biology supplies for Capitol Hill High School, astronomy textbooks and telescope kits for John Marshall High School, and a mobile science lab for Heronville Elementary. Our employees have also been involved in a pen pal program with Westwood Elementary for the past several years where we've written letters back and forth throughout the year. And BOK is the presenting sponsor for Junior Achievements Finance Park to assist high school students with financial literacy. In other words, education's a big deal at BOK. Today, Bank of Oklahoma has also given $50,000 in college scholarships to Oklahoma City area public school students that are in need of financial assistance, and we plan to continue that funding ahead. I'm excited to share a quick video about the impact our scholarship program is having on these students and hear what he has to say about his experience at college. Thanks. We recently asked Evan Bostic, one of our 2017 scholarship winners, what it meant to him to receive the Bank of Oklahoma scholarship. So receiving the scholarship made easier for me financially to go to school. I didn't have to worry about paying for school. I was able to get an on-campus job instead of an off-campus job. And it has given me knowledge and has really opened doors for me. Working in the offices at the school, I get to work here over the summer and not having to focus on, you know, working a job, working two to three jobs or trying to get money up for school um, outside of campus. It's really helped me in that way. I, I like the college experience. Um, I like college and I did better um, than I thought I would do. So I'm proud of myself. So I like living on campus. I feel like I got a better experience of the campus. Waking up, going to bed and college life versus my other friends or people who I know who didn't live on campus. So I would suggest living on campus your first year and getting that college experience. Bank of Oklahoma is honored to be helping talented Oklahoma City students be successful in college. We will be continuing our program and we want to invite once again Oklahoma City high school seniors to apply October 1st through March 1st 
for a scholarship to help them reach their college goals. Thank you very much, John. Appreciate that. Okay, perhaps outside the room you saw big large boxes being filled with school supplies. And the Chamber, along with the American Fidelity Assurance Company, are coordinating a school supplies drive to donate to the Boys and Girls Club of Oklahoma County. And those supplies outside the room, and also those are not for you to play with during lunch, all the pieces on your centerpiece will actually be donated to basically benefit kids across the city. So we thank you for that collaboration, that's important. So now to the heart of today's program, and I'd like to introduce your MC for today. That's Teresa Rose Crook. Teresa is Vice Chair of Education for the Greater Oklahoma City Chamber. That's her volunteer role. Her paid role is Executive Director of Community Foundations of Oklahoma. Please help, help me welcome Teresa Rose Crook. Thank you, Rhonda, and thanks to each and every one of you for being here today. Education, business, and industry are symbiotic. Our economic future is dependent on our workforce, and the training and education for that workforce begins in our schools. Conversations have heightened and uh, an awareness has increased around education and certainly has intensified since we met in this room last year. In just one year, education, particularly teacher funding and teacher shortages, made the top headlines in the Daily Oklahoman over a dozen times. From grassroots involvements to the legislative process to a record number of educators running for political office, never before in recent decades has education dominated the policy discussion and grassroots activities of our city. The legislature, now they stepped up by passing a historic teacher pay raise in the most recent legislative session. And that is feeding more momentum and traction toward tackling the tremendous issues that face our common schools and our institutions of higher learning. Now, three years ago, the Chamber partnered to form a very innovative and collaborative effort to help build community ownership of Oklahoma City Public Schools and its outcomes. The key partnerships in this collaborative were the City of Oklahoma City, United Way of Central Oklahoma, the Foundation for Oklahoma City Public Schools, Oklahoma City Public Schools, of course, and the Chamber. This partnership it is aimed specifically at helping address two primary concerns. First, maintaining consistency and focus when there are the inevitable changes of elected leadership and staff leadership. And second, helping the schools with challenges not directly related to classroom instruction Challenges that they shouldn't have to tackle alone. And so the, the compact is what it's called, the Oklahoma City Compact, um, has taken on several initiatives that have been asked of us by the district. We're always very careful to make sure that the district says these are our needs. This is what we really would like for your help with. So today, I want to say thank you specifically to some organizations, some businesses, many of you are in the room, that have helped financially contribute to the work of the compact by being compact benefactors. American Fidelity Assurance Company, The Boeing Company, Devon Energy, Loves Travel Stops and Country Stores, OG&E Energy, and the United Way of Central Oklahoma. Please help me say thank you to these organizations. Now, most of the work of the compact is done by special task force, including, first, um, the Reading OKC Task Force, which is led by Mary Malone at the Foundation for Oklahoma City Public Schools. 
Now, this task force brought together over 50 community leaders representing their businesses to help focus and create a culture of reading and literacy. Key programming includes reading challenges during school break times, as well as access for students to both online reading materials as well as, I'm kind of old-fashioned, plain old books. I know, my kids laugh at me, but I still love the smell and touch of a book. They also have implemented a program of little libraries. Now, if you haven't seen the little libraries and you want to sponsor one, they are super cool. They are exactly what they sound like, little libraries. They look like the old-fashioned newspaper stands, um, but they are filled by their sponsor with free books. So any student, any adult, anybody in our community can walk up to a little library, take a book, take it home and read. That's a very critical part of building a culture of reading and of literacy in our community. The second task force that the Compact took on was mental health. <clears throat> Led by Debbie Hampton of the United Way and Commissioner Terry White from the State Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse. This task recently led a confidential survey of all 6th, 8th, 10th, and 12th graders in Oklahoma City Public Schools. The survey was very strategic, very analytical, in helping us understand the challenges that our children are facing, helping us truly understand where they are and what mental health and social services supports they need so that they can truly mentally, emotionally, and physically be ready to learn. The goal of this work is to match the district, or is to work with the district to match evidence-based programs to the specific school with the most needs, with the most um, effective and appropriate program for their student population. We are currently piloting, preparing to launch a pilot, excuse me, at several targeted schools. The programs will include training for school professionals, counseling services, interventions for students and parents. They will also be seeking funding to help support the spread, the ongoing mission of this task force. So if anybody's interested, you know how to reach me. We're always looking for support and funding. Mental health is a critical component for our students' success, which is a critical component for our workforce and the economic driver of our state. And finally, Oklahoma City Public Schools asked for assistance from the Compact to do an analysis of the district's budget and to make recommendations for the 2018-2019 school year. As you may recall last spring, the school district, after year after year after year of budget reduction, faced again a year of having to make some very tough decisions about resources and expenses. The Compact organized a budget efficiency task force of very high level strategic thinking community leaders with a multitude of experience in leading private, public, and nonprofit organizations in finance, budget analysis, and audit. The task force presented their recommendations to the school board and the administration and included in those recommendations was almost $1.5 million in savings and revenue options. The task force will continue to work and help the district on whatever future budget challenges they have, whatever other ways that they ask us to help. And we've already been talking with Superintendent McDaniel about different ways that we can help them and help bring you all, your expertise, your business acumen, to full force to help support our schools and our school district and its students. Now other communities, interestingly, are taking note of this very innovative approach. They're taking note of our compact. And several have already reached out to learn more about this approach, about this community approach and support for our public schools. In just three years, the compact has been doing groundbreaking work 
and we hope to continue beginning be bringing these resources to Oklahoma City Public Schools for years and years to come. Now there are many partners and initiatives that I don't have time to mention today, but one thing is absolutely for certain. The increased dialogue and new perspectives around education will result in new opportunities for solutions. Today, we're going to hear from two leaders who are charged with leading two of our most valued educational institutions, Oklahoma City Public Schools District and the University of Oklahoma. Now, here's some directions, so I need you to listen. On your table, there are little white cards, okay? At the end of both speakers' presentations, we have reserved time for question and answers. So what I'm asking you to do is during those presentations, during lunch, please write down questions that you have. Chamber staff is going to be walking around. Um, please give that question to the chamber staff and at the conclusion of each speaker, um, I'll come back and ask those questions. Now I'm telling you, your questions are gonna be so much more interesting than mine. So if you want it to be an engaging time, please give us answers so you don't have to just hear my questions. Um, first, I'd like to introduce and welcome Dr. Sean McDaniel, the new superintendent of Oklahoma City Public Schools. His extensive bio is in your program, but while he makes his way to the stage, I'll give you a few quick highlights. Mr. McDaniel is a longtime Oklahoman and educator with more than three decades of experience in education. He joined Oklahoma City Public Schools from Mustang Public Schools, where he served as superintendent from 2012. His knowledge and expertise are recognized at the state level, where he has served on the Governor's Education Advisory Board, the State Superintendent's Advisory Council, and on the Oklahoma School, Secondary Schools Activities Association Board of Directors. He also serves on the Cavett Kids Foundation Board. And again, if you have questions from Dr. McDaniel, please fill out a card, wave it to your chamber staff, and we'll get it asked. So please help me welcome Dr. Sean McDaniel. Sounded like a golf clap. <laughs> Look at you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So thank you, Teresa, for the introduction. I am extremely grateful for the opportunity to talk to you today about uh, Oklahoma City Public Schools. For the past couple of months, I have been drinking from the fire hose. So what I'm gonna do for the next 15 minutes or so is turn that fire hose back to you and uh, give you as much as I can in the time that I have. So uh, attached to your chairs are seat belts, so if you'd buckle up. Zach, I saw you actually looking for the seat belt. This is gonna be good. I appreciate uh, all of you being here today. So what a difference uh, one year makes. Last year at this very function, I was sitting in the back with a half a dozen uh, from my team in Mustang and we were listening to the superintendent roll out some of the vision for the schools and give us the state of the schools last year. Uh, little did I know, never crossed my mind that one year later, uh, here I would be addressing this group. So since then, uh, as Teresa has, has kind of lined out for us, education has experienced a great deal. Uh, we were all participants or observers of this thing we call the teacher walkout and all that came from that. Certainly a, a historic time. But there's some things that I don't want you to forget uh, that happened kind of behind the scenes maybe from your perspective in public schools. So big national or international type things uh, that occur that we watch on television and the impact that those things have on public schools. So things like DACA, protests, kneeling for the anthem, the election cycle, I could go on and on. And all of these national type things have school level impact and we deal with those things from the teacher level, from the school leader level, all the way to the district level. 
Lots of things have gone on uh, that we're paying very close attention to. Lots of challenges and changes, but of course the biggest change for me, outside of uh, kicking my youngest son out of the house off to TU and us now being empty nesters, my wife Tracy. Thanks for being here today, Tracy. Yeah. I'm going to talk about you here in a minute. But the biggest thing outside of that has been this new gig, this new position, and I am extremely grateful uh, to have the opportunity given to me by our Board of Education to be the superintendent of schools uh, for Oklahoma City. It's been a lot to digest in a short amount of time, but I am honored. Before we dive in and go any further, I want to take just a minute to recognize uh, our board members. So if you are a member of the Oklahoma City Public Schools Board, would you please stand up and allow us to recognize you? Got a quorum. Uh-oh, wait a minute. You guys split up. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for, for being here and supporting me today. And then I know I have several cabinet members and principals and other employees maybe scattered. If you're an employee of the Oklahoma City Public School District, will you please stand and allow us to recognize you as well? All right. Thank you. So I feel compelled right now to do many of you in the room a big favor. And in doing this, I'm actually going to save you a little bit of money. So the first couple weeks that I was on the job, I was asked dozens of times a series of questions. Uh, same questions offered up by dozens and dozens of people. And I'd get home and Tracy would ask me, how'd your day go? And I'd tell her a little bit about the day, but I'd always say, you know, if I had a nickel for every time somebody asked me whatever the question was, I would be rich. And so I'm going to do you this favor, and this is for this group only, so if you hear me speak next week or later this week, I'm going to charge you a nickel if you ask the question. So I, I, my strategy changed. Instead of wishing that I would have had a nickel, every time these questions are asked now, I'm charging you a nickel. T today I've got 37 nickels in my pocket, and so I'm going to give you a reprieve. So here are the questions. You can imagine, I'm sorry, here are the answers. So you can imagine what the questions might be. So number one, a frequently asked question. Are you aware that you're the 13th superintendent in the last 18 years? Yes, I am aware. Saved you a nickel. The second is, are you aware that you're the fourth superintendent in the last two years? Yes, I am aware. So you don't need to ask that. Save your nickel. And then another popular question is, are you enjoying your job? And I've got to say a resounding, absolutely, yes, I'm enjoying this job. And the reason I'm enjoying this job is because of the people who are around me. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about our people here in just a second. Now, there are two other questions that I want to dive into a little bit more. I don't know if you care about this or not. There are probably some curiosity in the room, and I do get asked this a lot. So uh, I've been asked this about 3,000 times in three months. Why did I take this job? I had a great gig in Mustang. I had a great team, a very forward-thinking board, just signed a new contract, a lot of great things going on in that community. Um, but there are a couple of things that, that really captured me about Oklahoma City Public Schools. One uh, was in the form of my wife again. We have a rule in our house that uh, there is no whining allowed, and we don't complain unless we come to the table with some potential solutions. And what I found myself doing, well, I should rephrase that, what she found me doing over the last several years was when there was a change in leadership in Oklahoma City, I would sit in front of the television, and I would whine about it. Why can't they keep a superintendent? What happened? What's going on? And she would be patient with me and remind me, uh, so what are you going to do about it? If you're not going to do anything about it, can we just zip it up? Uh, there would be another transition, and at the dinner table with my son and, and Tracy, I would whine again, but I would offer nothing. Just, I can't believe they're going through another one. And she finally had had enough, and, and one evening she said, all right, here's the deal. We've got a rule in this house, unless you come with some solutions, you got to quit whining about this. Either step up and do something about it, 
or just don't talk about it anymore. So I got to thinking. And one thing led to another. Uh, I don't know why I hadn't thought about this before, but my background is very similar to uh, what is going on in Oklahoma City. I was raised in Federal Heights on the north side of downtown Denver. Uh, K-12, that's my neighborhood. I'm going back there this afternoon. Uh, and just so you know, President Gallagher, I'm going to have to slip out a little early. I'll try and catch all of your speech. But uh, my father is having a library named after him this afternoon at 430 in Denver. So uh, we are so proud of him, and I want to make sure I get there for that. And then I'll be back uh, on a plane first thing in the morning. But uh, the other piece of why I wanted to come here was just that, that this, uh, when you drive uh, south Oklahoma City, and I went to U.S. Grant the other day and walked the building and got to go to uh, Mary Golda Ross Elementary School, and that south side of Oklahoma City could be my neighborhood where I grew up. So it is very familiar. Uh, my f five best friends in the whole world uh, growing up in my neighborhood uh, were from Hispanic descent, and I spent my lifetime in their homes. And what I did learn was about their culture. What I wish I would have paid more attention to was their language, because now I had to spend my birthday Barnes & Noble gift card to go buy Spanish for Dummies. I really did this. And I've enrolled in our foundation's uh, after-school course where I'm going to learn how to speak Spanish. Um, I will do whatever I need to do to better connect with our kids in our community. Uh, of course, not everybody was on board. My dad, I mentioned him, 42-year veteran in education. I won't tell you exactly what he said when I told him that I was considering moving to Oklahoma City into the district, uh, but he really challenged me and, and asked me those great questions that dads do. Uh, and now it's a reality. And I could not be uh, more thrilled. The next question and then we're going to dive into some observations, is how long will I stay? That is a quarter question. So if you ask me that, that's a quarter. Okay. I, uh, I cannot see into the future, um, but my plan is to stay. I pitched out the number 10. My intention is to stay. And if I can get 10 years and then reevaluate and see how the Oklahoma City Public school's machine is running, uh, then we'll reevaluate at the time. Of course, as you know, that decision is not entirely up to me. Speaking of the board, <laughs> I want to tell you uh, about s some things that mean a great deal to me, just personally, professionally. I think these things uh, make other things work. Unfortunately, over the years, and I've watched this as a resident of Oklahoma City, uh, I think this happens from time to time in organizations. Outsiders take possession of the narrative of the organization. Okay, so when I was outside of the district, uh, doing my thing in Mustang and other districts and having my conversations, you would hear an outside narrative about what is happening in Oklahoma City. And I'm here to tell you, I don't know everything, about Oklahoma City public schools, but I do know that the narrative is much different inside than it is outside, and it begins with people. Um, I have never met in my life so many passionate people uh, that are employees of this district who love to come to work, they love our kids, they love doing what they do. Despite the, the monumental challenges that the district has had over the years, they still come to work, uh, and they do everything within their power to make things right for kids. Uh, and, and I love that about the city. And I love that about our school district. We have board members who I became convinced very quickly. And, and so you kind of know the, the back story. What I try and do is meet with them individually. I've had an opportunity to do that multiple times with each of them and talk to them on the phone. And they can get to understand me and I can get to understand them. I became convinced very early that Every one of our board members cares deeply about our kids. And further, they understand better than anybody the challenges that we face. And so I have had a wonderful time getting to know this board. Um, they have done some incredible things to date, and I am very confident that they will continue to do that. So that's what I've noticed. Uh, here's another thing. In case you didn't know, Oklahoma City Public Schools is a gigantic district. I want to give you some numbers just to put this in context. Oklahoma City Public Schools runs the largest restaurant in the state, serving over 400, 
1,000 meals per week. We have the largest transportation fleet, the largest Wi-Fi network. We have 52 languages spoken, 6,000 employees and 45,000 students in 85 schools. It is a gigantic organization. I need just a second to let that sink in. Wow. That's big. That's a lot. It's a lot of customers and a lot of stakeholders. But here's what I expect to happen. This is not a hope. I had a, a guy that I worked with for years, and every time somebody would say, I hope this, I hope that, he would always return with, hope is not a strategy. You've got to get from hope to expectation. So here's some expectations I have. There is greatness all across the public school district in Oklahoma City. Greatness everywhere. Everywhere you turn, you will see a pocket of it. The expectation needs to be that we will have an excellent school district and that that will dominate the narrative moving forward. Not, it's kind of good over here, it's really good over here, it's not so good over here. We expect to have an excellent school district. And so I think the narrative has to change that way, and we do that by action. Here are a few innovative programs and partnerships that I was excited to see in place as I arrived. And this is a glimpse we have a bilingual teacher pipeline. This is one of the most innovative things that we have going. Us uh, and a handful of districts across the country are doing this. And so if you are a support employee in Oklahoma City Public Schools and you speak Spanish, we will pay 100% of your bachelor's degree and plug you in as a teacher uh, in our school system. So you're a support employee, you speak Spanish, we pay for your bachelor's degree while you're continuing to work for us. Right now we have 39 teachers in the pipeline and we will add that to our teacher core uh, very soon. With a student population that's 54% uh, Spanish speakers, that is uh, something that we need more and more and more of. And we're excited for that to grow. We have a summit learning program for those not familiar with it. This is a technology based, self-paced student program. Uh, we have it in 10 schools. We're going to expand. We're seeing uh, some pretty impressive results right now. We have a tremendous partnership with OU. Recently we hired, uh, we added uh, five new social workers to our school district. And with each social worker through this partnership, we will get three practicum students. So 15 students by adding five uh, additional social workers to address the, the many challenges that our kids face. Uh, you may be familiar with Fields and Futures, Tim McLaughlin and his bunch. Uh, they had a vision, Tim had a vision, uh, that if kids will stay in school and graduate, they will become productive. How do you keep kids in school? You appeal to them. They've got to have something they connect to. And so Fields and Futures said, we're going to build brand new athletic complexes and fields at every middle and high school in the district. Okay, so he's taken that on. So if kids play, they will stay. If they stay, they will graduate. We know the mountain of evidence and research that speaks to kids who belong to some sort of extracurricular or after school program. Uh, their chances of graduating exponentially increase. They will stay out of trouble, they'll attend more. All those good things outcomes that we desire will come to pass. And so uh, our Police Athletic League partnership, get this, last year alone, Powell was uh, in over 40 of our elementary schools reaching over 3,000 elementary age kids, providing mentoring, coaching, homework help, tutoring, uh, really adopting kids to meet the needs that they have while providing them a venue uh, to participate. We just opened a child care center at U.S. Grant High School so that high school students who have children, babies, don't have to drop out, they don't have to quit, they don't have to give up on their dreams. They have child care, and it's bilingual child care when needed, right there on campus so that they continue their studies. We, we met a young lady who's a volleyballer, a basketballer, and runs track, and before this came around, she was contemplating dropping out of school. And now she has a way to continue pursuing those dreams that she has. Hudeberg has just partnered with our foundation. Uh, they're donating a car uh, in our driving attendance campaign. 
So this May, one of our high school seniors will receive a car. So I could go on and on and on. I think the gist of this, as, as you uh, understand very clearly, is without our community support, our ceiling becomes very low. And we are so grateful for what you do. Uh, I had no idea the depth of the generosity uh, in our community uh, until I came on board the last couple months. So in the last 30 days on the job, I've logged about 100 meetings, small group, big group, three or four a day, individual. Uh, and in those meetings, hundreds and hundreds of you and others have said, plug me in. How can I help? Uh, I want to be a part of the success of the school district. Steady support from our incredible foundation. We have Code a Kid programs. We have Kit a Kid programs the bilingual pipeline that I mentioned, Partners in Action. Uh, the foundation is incredible at connecting our community partners to the needs that you heard Teresa talk about, and we are grateful for them. So kind of coming in for a landing here, equally important, all the things that you've heard me talk about are the areas of opportunity uh, that I believe exist in our school district. When I came on board, I occupied my time with meetings and then reading as much as I could uh, the strategic plan, all the documents, the budget, everything I could get my hands on. I wanted to read it. I wanted to become familiar as best I could uh, through the documents that were available. And so very pleased to find some good stuff in our strategic plan. You, you know it as the great commitment. It is full of smart goals. That, that are sustainable, that we can reach, that we can measure. It is full of great strategies, four pillars for success. So I'm not going to be the guy that comes in and totally upends everything and wipes the slate clean and says, I'm going to bring my stuff in. I'm going to look to see what has promise. We're going to collaborate as a team in Oklahoma City Public Schools, and we're going to keep things that have potential to work on the tracks. I think that's a relief maybe for some because it, the 13 and 18, uh, that brings a lot of heartache, a lot of fatigue. And many times when people come in, as, as most of you know, there, there is this uh, let's wipe the slate clean and bring in good stuff that, that I think will work. And in this case, what we're going to focus on in the plan is we're going to focus and accelerate the measurement piece and the monitoring piece. They're not missing, but we're going to pay more attention to that. And so great plans, great goals in place. Clearly, we need to do a better job in increasing our academic results. We recognize that. And so the things that we put in place, the things that we choose to accelerate, will get us to that end. Another thing that we're very focused on uh, is the conversation about equity. If I ask 12 people in the room to define equity, I'm going to probably get four or five different answers. And so we have whittled to a single term or definition that we have collectively gotten a hold of. And then it will manifest itself in a number of different ways. But I think for me and, and for us, when we talk about equity, we are talking about providing access to opportunities to everyone, every student in the district, regardless of what part of town they live in. We want them to have access to opportunity. Many times what they do with opportunity, they're going to need help with that, uh, and we cannot be fully responsible for that. But what we can be fully responsible for is providing access to the opportunity and removing obstacles that are in the way between our kids and that thing we call potential. And so we are laser focused on that initiative. I think it's important to know that uh, I think from me uh, to our team, and, and we all understand this, that, that equity is not an initiative. Equity is a way of life. It's the way we do business. It is embedded in our thinking. It is embedded in our action. It has to do with uh, equitable staffing, equitable resources. Uh, it has to do with a lot of other things besides just that simple opportunity, access to opportunity. So we're fleshing that out, and we're creating action plans, and we're very excited about that work. Um, our board has been very thoughtful about this over the last couple of years, and we're one of the very few districts around 
that has an actual adopted school board policy that speaks to equity. So it's not a guideline. It is not something we hope for. It is something that our board has said, this is a priority in this district, and we will take action steps to get where we're going. So I'm very pleased with that. A lot of other things that, that we're looking to do, I know that I'm running up on my time, and uh, as with most things in business, this comes down to, and I know you all are familiar with this at some point in your careers, that we've got to learn how to be innovative and how to do more with less. I am absolutely thrilled at the step that was taken in our legislative session last session. Um, it, is a, it is a huge positive step for public education and for our teachers, and I fully expect uh, that to continue. Um, have been able to develop great relationships with many of our legislators. I think that there is an optimism. Uh, there's gonna be a lot of hard work to be done, but I'm, I'm looking forward to this next session. And so finally, wrapping it up, um, I wanna leave you with these thoughts. You know, we're getting ready to undertake some real hard decision making in our district. We've enlisted a, a firm uh, to come in and do a facilities audit across our district. Every facility, every school, every structure, uh, we're gonna be provided with a one pager or, or a cut sheet of sorts that gives all the, the data uh, from enrollment trends over the last five to 10 years to square footage, to utility usage, to academic achievement. We're gonna get all this information and then we're gonna make some decisions moving through this year about what our school district looks like moving forward. Hard decisions will be made, but I kind of look at it this way. Our kids are used to hard things. Um, you know, we have a picture, I thought we had a picture of Courtney, get there, of, of graduates. And so if we wanna get there, um, Many of our kids are gonna go through some very difficult challenges. I'm gonna give this to you in context. You know, the least that we can do as adults uh, is make the hard decisions and in doing so, make their lives better. Our kids uh, are described this way, statistically, okay? So obviously there are, are exceptions to this. Over 90% qualify for free and reduced lunch in our district. And for those who are unaware, a free and reduced number is simply an indicator of poverty. Oklahoma is number one for females who are incarcerated and number three for males, and number one overall for incarceration. And many of those inmates have children in our school system. In fact, in Oklahoma City Public Schools, one of four across our district, remember we're a district of 45,000 students, one of four has had at least one parent who has been incarcerated. Hundreds of our children are in foster care. Over 3,000 children last year, Oklahoma City Public School students, over 3,000 were identified as homeless. If I walk into a classroom today of 25 kids, 16 of them, according to the survey that was referenced earlier, have experienced moderate to severe depression in the last 12 months, 16 of 25 across our district. And one in five, according to the same survey, say that they have a feeling of hopelessness. And I'm telling you that to tell you this, our kids uh, are incredible. You know, I, I, am, I get so tired of the narrative about kids today, they're gamers and they're lazy and this and that. I'm here to tell you that our kids today are the most creative, innovative, compassionate kids we've ever had in any generation, my opinion. And so they're going to make it, but good. They're going to make it, but they need our help. And, and so that is an aim that we have. And, and you know, I'm not much for sugarcoating, and I hope I haven't done that today. This is a reality. Um, I don't wanna stand in front of you and just put my hand out and say, hey, we need your help. Uh, we will commit to doing the hard work internally. We'll dig through the data, we'll look for uh, inefficiencies, and we'll look for solutions. And we will make hard choices. And I commit to coming back to you uh, with positive reports. Uh, we're gonna be very transparent through any process that we undertake, uh, and so I wanna bring celebration back to you. So what do we need from you? 
whether or not they walk in and out of your front door every day or do their homework at your table, they are yours. These students are yours. They're not ours and ours alone. We all have a stake in the success of our public school system. We need them to be able to walk in and out of all of our doors successful and ready to become productive citizens. And that's a great challenge. Uh, and I would ask that you all consider continuing to be a part of that or step up and begin becoming a part of that. As business leaders, you know the challenges uh, better than anyone associated with recruiting folks who do not have the basic skills that they need to be successful with you. So the foundation is a vital part of making these connections. They are the conduit that allows our community to get involved through partners in action and donors choose. There are a myriad of things that you can do, including being reading buddies, being mentors, uh, helping with supplies and backpacks, etc. I know that trust is a difficult thing, but I believe we can do this together. Everyone loves to be a part of a success story, and I appreciate the success stories that you have been a part of, and I would invite you to continue down that path. Now, I know that I'm on, on the clock here and uh, that I'm in the way of lunch and President Gallagher. And you can believe I do not want to get on his bad side. So thank you. I appreciate you. Thank you, Dr. McDaniel. You're we welcome. appreciate your comments. Um, but we have a few questions. Okay. And uh, group, I have to commend you. Fantastic job on submitting some really great questions. Um, so we'll start with one. I'm not going to even call it easy. It's not even funny to say it's easy. Um, hey, I'm, I'm, a, I'm running out of time here. Right? <laughs> do, well, then you we better answer fast. Do we have time for this? All right. <laughs> Um, if you could eliminate one major problem or roadblock in your job, what would it be? One major problem or roadblock in my job? What, um, a couple things come to mind. A roadblock for me is the clock. I don't have enough time in the day uh, to accomplish all that we need to accomplish. Um, so that would be one. Can I give you one more? Yes. I, I think um, one of the things that that I would eliminate would be some of the negativity uh, that goes on around our school district. We need people who are uh, positive. They come through the doors with solutions. Um, they empower us. They believe in us. They encourage us. Clearly, we have work to do, but it is much easier and much more palatable if we all know that there is a force behind us prodding us and pushing us. So. I think negativity, I love positivity. I love being around positive people. So I think those are a couple. I love that. And I would, I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to try to find a way for us as a community to take on the McDaniel household challenge of if you don't got a solution, you don't get to complain. Um, I'll, I'll be back to you on that. Um, so second question. How does the ethnic makeup of Oklahoma City Public Schools and adverse childhood experience, ACEs, complicate your task to improve the education experience? Well, I, I think it complicates it when people don't understand it. And so one of the commitments we need to make is uh, a level of professional development and training. So many times in education I've seen over the years, if uh, I have not received proper training, and I'm talking about uh, cultural relevance training, for example, if I'm teaching in front of a class I'm looking at a class full of kids, and I see two or three kids who have their heads down. Um, I might immediately jump to a conclusion that that's a lazy kid or a disinterested kid. The reality is that child may have come from something that I'm not aware of, and that takes a very high level of training. It's not just common sense that I recognize all the problems and all the challenges my kids deal with. And so I think we have got to commit to training about ACEs. We need to train uh, our, kid, our teachers about cultural, uh, how to respond, how to be sensitive to, to culture. And in doing so, I get into uh, an engagement with kids and families about what is occurring, and I can teach them differently. So I think that's, a, that's something that, that we need to really address in our school district, for sure. Great. 
And last question, then okay. you do get to sit down and have lunch. Um, how do you define success for Oklahoma City Public Schools? Test scores, increased enrollment, community support, or is it something completely different? So you all can answer that. Yes, yes, and yes, right? Uh, success looks different for different kids and different schools and different families. So I think to have a cookie cutter, this is success, uh, I think may not be what we're looking for. Uh, certainly, we want to increase our attendance rates. We know that attendance is directly connected to outcomes like test scores. Um, we want to increase test scores. And we want to increase community engagement. But for many kids and many households and, and many schools in general, uh, success looks much different. It can be one of these kids who are coming out of a challenge and we have a great superstar teacher who pulls the kid in and learns about what's going on and I can meet a need um, that may not show up on a test score. It will later. It may not show up in an A through F grade per se, but we just created success for a student who had not experienced that type of success yet. So I think it's different. Uh, generally for the organization, we have got to address test scores. We have got to address attendance. We have got to address equity. I think those are three big ones that we need to really be focused on. That's it? That's all you got? That's it. Seriously? Well, no. Actually, we have over um, 20 more. Well. Um, so, and truly, thank you all so much all right. for submitting some outstanding questions. Given that we did think you wanted to eat lunch today and your employers would like for you to go back to work, um, what we're going to do is have a follow-up interview with Dr. D McDaniel and post that interview on our online uh, magazine, Velocity. So please give us a couple of days, but then please take a look at the Chamber's online magazine, Velocity, and you can see the full interview that we're gonna have with Dr. McDaniel. So please, let's say thank you again. Good. Good. As promised, we're gonna have lunch, and then we're gonna hear from Dr. G Gallagy, no, yes, I'll get it, I'll get it right um, after lunch. So please enjoy your lunch. Here to resume today's program, please welcome the Vice Chair of Education for the Greater Oklahoma City Chamber, Teresa Rose Crook. Thank you. Um, I hope that you've enjoyed your lunch, and um, we are going to go ahead and continue with our program, but please finish eating. Enjoy that yummy dessert. I don't know about any of you. I had to indulge in the chocolate, and it is fantastic. Now, I am pleased to welcome the new president of the University of Oklahoma, James Jim Gallagher. President Gallagher is with us today to detail the critical role and impact higher education institutions have on improving the future talent pipeline, in addition to his new role and personal vision for the future of the university. President Gallagher took office as the 14th president of the University of Oklahoma on July 1st. He has a distinguished track record of running large, complex organizations and is known as someone who invests in mentoring, inspiring, and teaching teams to achieve exceptional results. His extensive bio is in your program, and again, you're great at following these directions. If you have any questions for President Gallagher, please write them on a note card, and the chamber staff will pick them up, and we will ask those questions of Dr. Gallagher once his presentation is complete. So now, Please welcome President Gallagher to the stage. Well, good afternoon. I had a dream come true this last Saturday. Coach Riley invited me to go to practice and see how our team was shaping up for its first game on September 1. 
And I watch them practice. By the way, they're looking pretty good. There are a few Sooner fans here, right? But the exciting part was at the end of practice, he invited me into the team huddle. What he didn't tell me was he was going to let me make the final speech to give these young men some energy before they went out and had a good time on Saturday night. So I was thinking to myself, what do you tell a group of champions like that when you're an ex-CEO? What kind of a pep talk do you give them? Well, I thought for a second and I said, I think I'll give them the same one that I gave Lincoln Riley the first time I met him. You see, the, the very first day I was on campus when I was going to be elected by the Board of Regents to be the next president of the University of Oklahoma, the very first two people I saw in the garage were Cope's Coach Stoops and Coach Riley. And so the three of us walked into the building together. Well, they had done a little bit of research because there was a rumor that I was going to be elected. And so Coach Riley, trying to make small talk, said, I see that you come from a very big family, Jim. I said, yes, 10 children. He said, what number were you? I said, I was number two, Coach Riley, but I've only been number two once in my life. Bob Stoops looks over at him and smiles and says, nothing's changed, coach. <laughs> we all know about the expectation for the Sooners when they come on the football field. In the last three years, we've been in the Final Four two different times. And, and of course, in the other athletics, we've been national champions so many times. And it's something that people expect out of the University of Oklahoma. And the way we recruit, the way that we coach, the way that we play, People expect us to be champions in football year after year after year. And we don't define championships by simply winning the Big 12 or going to a bowl game, but do you get on that final stage and have a chance to win the national championship? And the people of Oklahoma expect us to not only be there, but to win. That's how all of us think when it comes to sports. I'm a Sooner, and so the very first time that I stood in front of 17,000 employees, sometimes via teleconference, and spoke to this new company that I went to work for as CEO in 2009, a company that was in Chapter 11 bankruptcy that had in excess of $20 billion in debt. They asked me to say a few words to the employees. And I said, very simply, I did not come here to help you get out of bankruptcy. We will do that within a year. I came to help you become the number one petrochemical company in the world. And we will do that before you can blink. That seemed like a very crazy thing to say when this was a company that nine out of the 10 years of the last decade was dead last in financial performance and now in the throes of bankruptcy. How could they possibly consider themselves a team that could go from worst to first? Well, that's exactly what they did. A year later, we came out of bankruptcy at $17 a share on the New York Stock Exchange. Four years later, triple B plus, strong investment grade, share price $115 a share. Every financial metric in the industry, we were basically number one, and we were almost passing Dow Chemical and market cap. Four short years later, the number one turnaround story on Wall Street, written, by a group of 17,000 people who were given an incredible challenge to be number one, to prove to the world that they were better than people thought they were, to act like Sooners on the football field, to be champions. It's all about expectations, isn't it? At the end of the day, what are your expectations for your universities across this state in terms of performance in different ways? What should you expect? When I had my first conversation with Clay Bennett about taking this job, he made the comment to me that, Jim, I'm heavily involved with so many things in Oklahoma, but there's one thing I know to be true, that what starts to happen here at the University of Oklahoma today will change what happens 
in our state 10 years from now. Nothing will be more important than what happens on our campuses 10 years from now than what we decide to do on our campuses today. I happen to agree with him. And that's why someone like me who spent his entire career at companies like ConocoPhillips, former Fortune 5 company, Lion Dobosel, a Fortune 100 company, would come and become a university president for really one purpose, to set a very high set of expectations and hopefully to change the economy of a state like ours here. Janet and I are so happy to come back and raise that bar in so many different ways. Some of you have heard me talk about financials. After the last Regents meeting, there was a lot of that in the press, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. But this is not a speech about financials. That's something we're going to take care of. This is a discussion about where we need to go in the state to make a change in higher education at the university level. The University of Oklahoma has a fabulous undergraduate program. You've heard the statistics about National Merit Scholars. You know we have honors colleges. You know we have residential colleges. And on and on and on. We have a rich, robust, wonderful undergraduate program. And we have spent a lot of effort building that. One of the things that perhaps you don't know is that universities' reputations are not built on the quality of their undergraduate programs nearly as much as the quality of their graduate programs, the research programs that frankly drive the economy of states. The undergraduate program helps to educate, but businesses and jobs and the economies are driven by the graduate programs in universities, and it's been proven time after time after time. That's not a new concept, but in the state of Oklahoma, we have not embraced that concept. The University of Oklahoma is going to change that. Our goal is to double our research in five years. That's never been done before by anybody. Our expectations are great because we are Sooners and that's what we do. Double the amount of research in five years. Second thing, we have an incredibly beautiful campus with many new buildings. Some of you have been on that campus, read about it, seen the pictures. It's an incredible place, and I thank the Borns for the wonderful job that they've done in building that place where we can do wonderful things. We don't have to build the place to make this happen. It exists. Now what we have to do, instead of putting capital in bricks and mortar, we now have to invest in human capital. We have not been paying our faculty well. Just like what's happening in the state of Oklahoma, in K through 12, and teacher pay, we have that same dynamic going on at the university level. Our faculty are generally paid about 10% lower than they should be. Some of our colleges are paid 20 plus percent lower than they should be, and that has to stop. We need to invest capital in those people who have been so dedicated and so loyal and have done so much already. We need to put money back into our faculty. We also need to go out and make cluster hires and bring in great scientists. We will not be able to accomplish doubling that research effort and driving the economy of the state of Oklahoma if we don't invest in that research. And that means new dollars, new programs to build out that research effort to drive our economy. That's significant dollars, but it's an investment that this state must make. It's an investment we must start to make. So undergraduate, focus on graduate now as an addition. Bricks and mortar capital, now to investment in human capital. You heard me say, if you read the paper, that our financials aren't great. So this seems quite a challenging thing, right? How are you gonna double research? How are you gonna pay faculty and all of that? And by the way, we also didn't increase tuition. We didn't increase tuition. The students applauded a lot louder when I told them that. And I think their parents did as well because we have to keep 
higher education affordable for the common person in the state of Oklahoma. And if we increase it 5% every year, we're not doing that. So we're going to take care of them. We're going to make sure it's affordable because that will drive our future. So we're holding tuition flat, going to give faculty raises, and then I talk about losing money two years ago, $30 million a year before that, $20 million, and all of this growth. How does that get accomplished? Very, very simply, in the last month and a half, we've been working very hard at the University of Oklahoma and finding those inefficiencies, and frankly, they're everywhere. We still do paper timesheets. We're about to come into the modern era where that's electronic. I have no idea why, but those kind of things are going to change very rapidly. We have silos in every college. Everybody does their own thing, and we don't have a common priority in terms of our faculty lines and what we're hiring and what the strategy is and how all of the things are done across that university, and those things are being fixed very, very rapidly. We're engaging with our faculty who want to see these changes too because they would like to have raises, they would like to do research again. They want to help all of us drive that economy in the state of Oklahoma. So we're getting all of their cooperation to help get this done now. And I'm happy to say that the budget that we didn't approve in front of the regents because we said this is not a satisfactory budget is being revised as we speak, and we've already been able to find a very significant number of cost savings that are in the millions of dollars that will report at the next Regents meeting. It's stunning what we've been able to achieve in a short month and a half, and so it gives me no worry about whether we'll be able to fix that quickly. Now, that's part of the effort. The other part is, is this worth investing in? as a state. I've said to the legislature, I am not going to come in and just continually complain to you about lack of funding for state higher education. I'd like to come in and talk to you about solutions, and I'd like to come and talk to you about investments. And investments in research that have sometimes multiples of two, three, four times the amount that's invested in returns every year it's something worth talking about at the legislature, I think. I think that's something that people should listen to and consider and hopefully use a university like OU as part of the growth and diversification of an economy here in the state of Oklahoma. We're going to be asking for some funding for those kinds of things. But we're going to walk in saying, and by the way, we have become efficient and we're not spending money on things that people will consider trivial. We have our priorities straight. The tuition for our students, the pay for our faculty, and research, and growing the reputation and the economy of the state. There are some other things that I think we need to address. And let me just give you a couple facts and figures because they're somewhat troubling to me. It's something literally I got some data on from some of our faculty this morning because I thought it was true, but I didn't know the details. We're number one in Oklahoma among all public universities in the number of higher education institutions per million residents. Is that what we want to be number one on? We have a very dispersed effort in higher education more institutions of higher education per million students than anybody else. We're number two in the number of higher ed institutions per 10,000 full-time equivalent students. We're dispersed in our effort to get this done. The average graduation rates for our students, we're five from the bottom. We're not graduating students. So this dispersed effort across all of these universities across the state of Oklahoma is not getting us results. And we can blame that on the amount that the legislature has given us as investments, but that's certainly not the whole story because a large number of those other states are doing a better job of this than we are. We can and will do better. 
Right, Glenn? We're working on it tomorrow in a meeting. We're sitting down. We're going to look at this hard and figure out what do we need to do to get this corrected as soon as possible to help get higher education fixed in the state of Oklahoma. I am incredibly proud to be back here representing my university. Janet and I were so honored to have our inauguration last year and, and have your faith and trust put in us. But the one thing I want to be very clear about here is just like every time we take that football field and you expect us to win, you should expect the same thing of your university in the classroom. Because frankly, our future depends on it. The economy of this state depends on us getting this right time after time after time. We will create businesses. We will do that through research. We will do that as a great public institution that is not number 80 in this and number 90 in that and a number 110 in that because we're the University of Oklahoma. Just like that football helmet that Lincoln Riley gave me that sits right behind my desk now, says number 14 on the back, President Gallagher. Only number two once. Signed, Lincoln Riley. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and now we have a few more questions. You ready? I'm ready. Okay. How can higher ed and Oklahoma City Public Schools work together to better prepare students for college? Well, there have been some questions about remediation that have been in the press lately, right? And, and one of the things we know is that a lot of the students that come to us at the university are not properly prepared. We need to do a better job of that because once they get there, we want them to be so well prepared that they're off to a running start and doing really well. We're not doing the job right either place right now. We're not doing it right either place. This does require investment, concentrated effort of all of us in the business community to change the paradigm of what we have today. And it starts K through 12. I came from a big family and most of my family members were educators. My father was a school teacher. After 25 years of service in the military, he went back to college to teach kids because he felt it was that important to do that job. So if some of you are sitting here in the business community thinking about what to do and all, my father actually went back to school to make a personal difference and Sarge was in that classroom all the time, super disciplined, getting that job done, winning all these awards as best teacher with his crew cut military haircut. We've got to do a better job at that and we have to fund it properly. Okay. How are demographic shifts, specifically Generation Z, in our population shaping the role of OU and how it partners to reach new generations of students. You know, I thought I heard a really wonderful comment about our students get better and better and better, and frankly, they do. Now, we can talk about whether they're well prepared in math and this and that, but if you see the kinds of things that they walk into the classroom knowing, I mean, one of my granddaughters who I was speaking to, Ella, and my inauguration talking about what it means to be a Sooner was just taking programming classes this summer and she's seven years old. You can't believe what she can do on a computer already. And so when we start to talk about are our kids well prepared and all of that, not all of them have the same opportunity. We need to really work on that. But some of our best and brightest are incredibly strong and bright and bring kinds of things that can change economies if we embrace that concept here in Oklahoma and make ourselves a research institution. Okay. Uh, OU Regent uh, Frank Keating suggested two tracks for, higher, for high school students, career tech for those that were not interested or ready to go to college, and um, the other would obviously go into college. What are your thoughts on that? Well, Actually, I have some experience in this being an ex-CEO in big companies and hired both groups of people. And frankly, we couldn't get enough of either. Couldn't get enough of either. 
One of our big issues in our plants was finding qualified welders and pipe fitters and carpenters and craftspeople. And by the way, those jobs pay incredibly well. And if you look at countries like Germany that embrace the concept that those are wonderful jobs and all, and that's an important part of our society, I personally think they've got that right. And that should be something that we should embrace and consider a dignified profession and, and maybe some of the too many institutions we have around the state of higher education, some of them should turn into trade schools and really help because that is a dire need that we all have in business. I'm sure all of you in this room are seeing the same kind of issue. And then on higher ed, yes, you know, these, we, we need that as well. And we need people who are capable, especially in IT and a lot of the STEM subjects. It's really hard to hire enough engineers. I was just out at Tinker. Uh, we were talking about that a couple weeks ago and they said we could hire every engineer and every IT person on our base that you can produce at the University of Oklahoma. We're having to go all over the, the place to find students in these disciplines. We can produce those students, but we have to change the model in the way we get that done. And last question. In what ways will the University of Oklahoma continue to support diversity and inclusion on the campuses and the broader community? You know, this is an incredibly important subject, and I'm glad that somebody asked me about that because, you know, I've made some changes recently in the position, and part of that is because I don't think we're doing a good enough job because there are people that are being left behind, and in our civilization today, that's totally unacceptable. Um, it's something that I'm personally committed to, will always be committed to, and, you know, there's so many window dressing things that people do I'm interested in graduation rates. I'm interested in people who don't have that chance early in life to have the probable success that others do, that somehow we allow them to bootstrap themselves and graduate and equal, start out with an equal opportunity when it's time to go into the workforce with everybody else. We can do a lot more than we're doing today, and, and I know that the regents are very committed to that with me, and, and frankly, we're going to do a lot better job than we've done in the past on that. President Gallagher, thank you so much for your time you. and your words. It's great to know that having heard from two of our um, exceptional education leaders in our state that our education system is in such great hands, I feel um, very inspired and excited about the future of education with President Gallagher and um, Superintendent McDaniel leading our efforts for both Oklahoma City as well as the University of Oklahoma. So thank you to both of our speakers today for enlightening us on the state of schools in Oklahoma. On behalf of the business community, I want to let our educators in the room know we are here standing with you, supporting you, and are committed to do everything that we can to help you as you educate our students for a better Oklahoma tomorrow. And I want to encourage the business people in the room to stay engaged. Please, as you heard from Pres uh, Superintendent McDaniel, there are multiple opportunities, whether it's Donors Choose or Partners in Action, um, supporting the Oklahoma City Public Schools Foundation, or however you choose, there's multiple ways to engage and support public education through Oklahoma City. And we ask you to do that. We ask you to think about how you most strategically can be of benefit to our students and to our systems. Make VelocityOKC.com one of your daily online reading sites as well, and stay up to date on new impacts and business opportunities throughout our community, as well as some of the Chamber's priority focuses for education. As a couple of um, our speaker, or both of our speakers mentioned, call your elected officials. Let them know your position on education. They need your help, and your elected officials need to know what you, as their boss, their constituents, 
think about supporting public education. The future of Oklahoma City is in our classrooms right now, and they deserve our full commitment, our attention, and our encouragement. Thank you all so much for attending today. We appreciate your time, we appreciate your attention, and remember to go to velocityokc.com to see the interviews of the questions that we didn't have time to ask on stage today. Thank you so much and have a great day.